we're thrilled to have Transgrid back on board as a sponsor for this event. And of course, can't say much, but we're really excited about the opportunity moving forward on how we, the, the Royal We, can work with Transgrid at that interface of electrical distrib energy distribution networks and agriculture. It's a really critical interface. So it's with pleasure that I'd like to introduce Suzanne Westgate, the General Manager Property uh, of Land, Property and Approvals from Transgrid, who would welcome our industry keynote. Thanks, Dave. Thanks so much for the introduction, Dave, and it's a silly title, Land, Property and Approvals. Um, I'm Suzanne Westgate, and I'd like to also pay my respects to the Wiradjuri people whose land we stand on today, and my respects to the First Nations elders, both past and present, of this land. For those of you who don't know, Transgrid is the high voltage network provider. And we've been tasked over the next decade to transition the network to renewables in New South Wales. To give you an idea, that's $16.5 billion worth of development in the southern states alone, and it's growing. While Transgrid isn't directly related to digital farming, we take a real interest in what's going on to our farming communities and what's important to them because that's the environment we live in. That's where we are. And these are the communities and the people that we are potentially gonna impact as this energy transition happens. So what's important to farming communities is important to us. Especially when it comes to digital connectivity, because it relies on energy. I just wanted to reflect very quickly on some of the comments I heard um, at another summit I was at this week. I was at the AFR, uh, annual summit on climate change and energy and heard from some energy experts and some ministers. The energy transition to renewables is here and it's really happening, but it's still not happening fast enough. There's now some real fear from energy experts that we're gonna face some long, hot, difficult summers and potentially face blackouts um, as the coal-fired generation closes off and we transition to renewables over a slower period. All of the research, whether you love it or you hate it, shows that the most efficient, best and cheapest way for all of us energy consumers um, to keep prices down and keep energy reliability and security is to transition as quickly as possible to a renewables economy. Now, my team and I have heard this message before, and we've heard it quite a few times, because at the forefront of the energy transition is regional Australia. And absolutely fundamental to the energy transition is our ability to develop long-term trusted relationships built on mutual respect and fairness with our regional communities, our farming communities, and our landholders. Without that, the energy transition will slow right down and these projects may not even go ahead. So it's a massive balancing act because there's a really big picture issue about energy security and fundamental to that is regional social license with our agricultural communities. Which brings me to a comment that Minister Bowen said a couple of days ago. The energy transition represents one of the biggest economic challenges and opportunities faced by Australia since the Industrial Revolution. So for events such as this and, and sponsoring and being here at, um, at a digital farming event is really important to us because it comes in the category of opportunities whether it's investing in 100 scholarships with CSU to help um, a regional skilled workforce to help drive the energy transition, or working really hard with our university colleagues to try and develop a sustainable energy and agricultural center in the Riverina for skills and training and innovation in both sectors or research and development into digital farm operations and how a new network or renewable sources might be able to help and be part of the solution rather than part of a problem. Or research projects into how we can minimize our impact and try and maximize shared benefits with farming communities. Or even just being here to connect and talk about shared pain points like supply chain challenges and workforce challenges and everyone's favorite regulation challenges. These are all super important for us to try and do our very, very best, not only to minimize our footprint, 
but to try and identify and maximise shared benefits from these energy transition projects for the communities they're impacting along the way, so that hopefully, in the longer term, we can keep those digital farm lights on. So thank you, CSU and Food Agility, once again, for having us. I'm looking forward to today's sessions. And I'm around, as well as um, some of the other two Transgrid team members, if you have any questions or comments or feedback. I see there's a few high school students here. So if obviously agriculture industry is your first choice for a career. But if you didn't want to go into agriculture, do come and talk to us about a job in energy. There's plenty going. Um, I am now tasked with handing over and introducing Mr. Richard Heath, who's from the Australian Farm Institute and an executive director. Richard um, is the Australian Farm Institute is an independent agricultural policy research organisation. Richard's a Nuffield scholar and was a farmer in Canada for 20 years until 2012. Previous to this career, Richard was an Associate Professor of Agronomy and Farm Management at the University of Sydney. He's currently a Director of the Grains Research and Development Corporation and a member of the CSIRO Agriculture and Food Advisory Committee. I think this all means he's one of those really big-brained people, so please help me to welcome Richard to the stage and give his address. <laughs> Uh, thanks, Suzanne, and uh, thank you to Dave and Richard and the whole Food Agility team for um, providing me with the opportunity to give uh, an industry address uh, to the theme of this conference, Paddock to Profit. So what I'm going to talk about in terms of how the industry can be involved in Paddock to Profit is one of the really big drivers that we're all seeing at the moment. It was mentioned quite a bit yesterday throughout many of the presentations, and that's addressing the ESG drivers that are now influencing so much of the business world, so much of the policy world, the sustainability agenda in its entirety, uh, and how the industry can respond to that in the paddock to profit theme. Um, so I'm going to start with the obligatory slide. Please become a member of AFI. Um, we're a tiny organisation. Uh, we punch well above our weight. We do rely on membership. Um, farminstitute.org.au. Have a look at us and please support us if you can. Okay. There is, this is not surprising, um, a frenzy of activity across ESG and sustainability. Uh, the number of people, organisations, and I put my hand up in this, I'm one of them, that now, you know, talk about ESG constantly as one of the big things you need to be aware of, it's really, really hard to miss. Um, but where, was, where is it coming from and what are the main drivers? Now, you'd expect me as CEO of a policy organisation to say it's all about policy and regulation. And of course, there are policy underpinnings to everything that is going on. But the tangible impact, what you're actually going to see and interact with in farm businesses are much more direct and they are much more commercially focused. They are our export destinations. We are an exporting economy when it comes to agriculture. And increasingly, the export demands around ESG are incorporating themselves into trade language, into market access, into trade agreements. They are supply chain pressures. So the ESG commitments that all organisations are making in supply chains now that are implementing at a farm level. And they are the financial institutions that we deal with every day. We heard Michael Whitehead talk a lot about it yesterday in terms of the pressures that banks are under. But it goes wider than that. It goes to insurance markets. It goes to the entire financial system and how that is being impacted by ESG as well. So those three in turn, the export destinations. Now the one that we hear about most, even though relatively little of our exports actually go to Europe, is the European situation, the farm to fork um, policy, um, which has you know, quite dramatic targets and ambitions around sustainability. 50% um, reduction in the use of pesticides by 2030. Um, reduction in fertiliser use by 20% by 2030. Now, when you think about all the demands that we understand 
around an increasing population and increasing food supply to be saying at the same time that we will also reduce fertiliser use by 20%. That's a huge goal and target to be able to do that effectively and not impact on food security. Why do we pay so much attention to this when so little of our exports go to Europe? It's because they set the agenda globally. They set the agenda because it trickles down into other countries and other regimes, but they also set the agenda because most global agribusinesses work and do business in Europe. It's a huge market for them. And so for the, a company like Bayer or Syngenta or Corteva, which are huge suppliers of agrochemicals into Australia, they're having to comply with that sort of pressure. So it will impact what happens here as well. Um, carbon border taxes. So the other thing that will start to happen is that as part of the EU legislation, anything that they expect their farmers to do, they will expect farmers to do that are importing into Europe. So everything will be adjusted at the border, whether it is carbon, biodiversity, pesticides even, um, there is going to be a penalty if you cannot produce to the same standard. Um, huge impact around deforestation legislation that's coming in there. So from next year, uh, everything that is imported into Europe will be required to display deforestation-free status. Going on to the ESG commitments. So this is what we're now getting more directly into the commercial world and what uh, Larry Fink from BlackRock has called stakeholder capitalism. What is the ticket to play now to get shareholder interest in any public company, essentially? It is the demonstration that you are a good corporate citizen from a sustainability context. And that means making commitments around environmental metrics, social metrics, and governance metrics. Very holistic view of sustainability. Most organisations are already doing it, and from next year in Australia, and a lot of people are unaware of this, there will be mandatory ESG reporting phased in. Starting from very large companies, but flowing through the whole economy over three years, every business will need to report on ESG um, targets. What does it mean in agriculture? So uh, this is a slide I love to put up from Nutrien, uh, big, world's biggest fertilizer company. That's in their ESG annual report. They've got eight ESG rating agencies. So each of those little um, lines down the side is a separate ESG rating agency that's rating nutrients performance. That's how important it is to them to show to the rest of the world what their ESG performance is. Um, and you know they've got ambitious targets around reducing greenhouse gas emissions. And that's why you've got the CEO of Nutrient Globally earlier this year, again, world's biggest fertilizer supplier, let me remind you, saying farmers need to use less fertilizer. It's bizarre. But that's the pressure. That's how that's translating. Um, Woolies, locally. So, you know, going to something much more domestic, again, setting uh, ESG goals and targets around a whole heap of things, but carbon emissions in particular. That's just scope one and two, which is more directly related to them. But they will have scope three emissions targets as well in the very near future, which will mean that uh, their suppliers, being farmers, will need to be reporting on carbon emissions to feed into their reportings. Financial and business pressures. So the task force for um, nature-related financial disclosures uh, is rapidly implementing itself into uh, financial systems around the world. And that disclosure mechanism is, is essentially a recognition of the risk to financial capital by not paying attention to nature. Now, it's taken a long time. This is something that is, you know, this whole concept around whether you call it triple bottom line accounting, corporate social responsibility, people profit planet, you know, it's not necessarily new concepts. But the modern version of it, which is this understanding of, of multi risk, sorry, risk, multi capital risk, 
where if you are not paying attention to all those other capitals that underpin financial capital, then your financial capital is at very big risk, is now absolutely understood, and there's so much data around that. So you, if you are not paying attention to natural capital and preserving natural capital, you are putting your financial capital under risk. Banks understand that, but more than that now, banks are going to be compelled legislatively to report against that because they are legally required to protect your financial capital. And so now they understand that to do that well, they also have to protect natural capital, human capital, social capital, all the capitals to be able to protect financial capital. So there's going to be a whole heap of frameworks and disclosure mechanisms and systems that go to how that is measured, reported on, um, um, and uh, reported against. Another one of those is the Net Zero Banking Alliance, a global alliance where banks set net zero targets. Every Australian bank has signed up to that, which means they will all be setting net zero targets in the very near future. And again, what that means is we have to report on it. Anyone they're loaning to has to report their net zero progress for them to be able to report against their net zero target in the Net Zero Banking Alliance. Okay, those are the pressures. Now, I'm someone that never likes just to sit there and admire the problem and what all the challenges are. We want solutions. And this is the industry part of what is the industry doing about all this? How that can the industry work in this environment and provide a solution? We need to move towards consistency on what sustainability is. So those three pressures that I talked about all actually have slightly different mechanisms around the reporting. Financial disclosures and natural capital accounting in the financial part of it is slightly different to sustainability frameworks and ESG reports for commercial, which again is slightly different to carbon markets, which will be used for carbon offsetting for border adjustments. They're all talking about the same thing, but they're different processes and the potential for that to impact on profitability because of transactional cost and because of regulatory cost is very real. And it's something that we really need to address as industry. The problem is not a shortage of programs and frameworks. There's hundreds of them, literally, Every industry is developing a sustainability framework, supply chain frameworks, commercial frameworks. There's multiple frameworks and disclosure mechanisms that are coming all the time. It is an incredibly confusing environment for farmers trying to work out how they participate. So what's the answer? Is Australian Agriculture Sustainability Framework. And this is the, the key to my presentation. This is how industry works into this environment. Now, I'm sure many of you would have seen me present on this before and seen a slightly different slide. You are the very first group to have debuted the new Australian Ag Sustainability Framework racetrack diagram. So what we are trying to do, because we want this eventually to be instantly recognisable, we want this to be as recognisable and used in the same way that, say, the UN SDGs are. You put a principle against a particular metric that you are delivering, or a particular practice that you are implementing, in the same way that corporates do now with SDGs. And you get the little SDG logo, logo and what it applies to. So we're trying to simplify it, we're trying to make the language easier, um, very happy to take on feedback about this version, it's still being iterated compared to if you've seen the previous ones. So you'll see it's been very heavily simplified now, just a few words for principle of sustainability. You, the, the full detail of that is obviously still behind it. Um, you can download it and get right into the detail of all the principles and the criteria that apply. But in its um, simplest form, it is 17 principles that describe what sustainability is. It is a definition of sustainability for the industry that we can all get behind and that any framework, so I'm not suggesting that though all those frameworks that I put up in the previous slide are not gonna to continue to exist. This in, isn't intended to be the one ring that rules them all. This is intended as an alignment mechanism. It's intended as a forum in the way that it will operate, the community of practice 
that helps anyone that's in the sustainability space to use common language, to understand developments in definitions of sustainability, science around sustainability, metrics that markets are expecting to get consistency. Because if we can get consistency, then we reduce that regulatory burden, we reduce that transactional cost, we make everything much, much easier to work. So, takeaway, sustainability is an unstoppable force influencing the modern business environment. Um, a better understanding of multi-capital risk is to financial capital is what's driving the business pressure on sustainability. Risk disclosure reporting and ESG goals and target setting are the tangible expressions of this pressure. It's going to have an impact on farm businesses, absolutely going to have an impact, but that impact can involve both risks and opportunities. The key to realising the opportunities, and this is the fundamental point I want to leave you with and how we've constructed the AASF, is that it is so important for flexibility and innovation in delivering sustainability outcomes that we work towards a principles-based set of sustainability standards. So the AASF describes sustainability principles. It doesn't prescribe sustainability is this practice because that is limiting. It's certainly limiting in terms of innovation and it is absolutely limiting in terms of regulatory impact. If you suddenly have something imposed on you as a practice change, that is the only option to deliver a sustainability outcome. What we must do is deliver sustainability goals. And we can all agree on sustainability goals. Reduce greenhouse gas emissions, increase biodiversity, clean up water, have fair contracting processes. Right? They're fundamental and I would argue universal truths that we can all get behind. But as long as we promote those goals as principles through a framework like the AASF, then we leave so much flexibility and innovation in terms of how we get to the top of the mountain. The practices that we can use to deliver against those goals. So I'd encourage you all, when you're, if you are in the sustainability space, if you're thinking about sustainability, working with other frameworks, please use the AASF, refer to the AASF, become part of the community of practice, and always think about those principles and goals that we're trying to deliver against. Thank you.